Okay, hello everyone and uh, good morning. Looks like, oh, you're back. Um, so sorry for the minor technical difficulties. So I'm Shan from the Kiwi Landing Pad. Um, and today we have a webinar um, with Tim Lam from Zero. Uh, super excited, marketing automation, one of my favorite topics. And I guess because we're running late, I'm gonna kick into um, the, we'll get Tim to introduce himself and then kick into the presentation. Um, 64 people joining us, how exciting our biggest webinar yet. Um, Tim, over to you. Are you there? Hey, um, Sean, can you hear me? Just let me know in the chat box if yeah. you like. And what I can do is I can kick off and worst case scenario, we can take, um, all right. Yep, all right. I'll, I'll kick off and we'll work through the slides and worst case scenario, we'll put the uh, questions in the um, question box there. Um, it's, um, I'm, gl I'm glad this isn't a, a presentation about uh, marketing technology or anything. So what, um, <laughs> I'm gonna use the um, uh, slide deck. So hopefully everyone can see that slide deck okay. Um, and I'm going to run through um, a bunch of slides here for a start, and then we'll have some Q&A at the end. And so I've got a bit of an agenda here, and I'll try and whip through these in about 30 minutes or so to save a bit of time for questions at the end. So what, what I'll talk about is, is my journey into marketing automation, and then um, tie that in uh, a little bit about un uncovering your US market. Um, and specifically with automation, I'll, I'll talk about just what that is and, and how that compares to maybe demand generation or some of these other terms like marketing operations as well. And I'll give a bit of an overview of how Xero uses um, marketing automation and I can answer questions about that also. Um, and then just at the end, I'll, I'll look to bring it together with the, with the um, you know, things that you can do remotely when you're not in the US versus um, tactics that you might wanna do when you're on the ground uh, here in the US. So I'll run through these. So. Um, just in terms of my journey in, into marketing automation, not, not of these photos as me. Um, so uh, I'm probably setting this up as me being the most, uh, or, or the least likely person to um, talk about marketing automation, but, but I started out, um, uh, at my first high school job was as a butcher and my first career was as a journalist. And um, why, why I sort of like to point that out, I think is because this um, area of marketing automation is quite a new space. And often people aren't coming out of university with a, a degree in marketing automation or <laughs> a, uh, you know, a master's in demand generation. People are often migrating into this area. Um, so, so I uh, actually moved from um, journalism into uh, marketing. And a lot of people sort of ask, you know, how I made that step or why does that sort of work? And I think in the B2B world, often a lot of um, B2B marketing is about how you use content um, to both get people in the door and then nurture them along the way. So I actually tend to think it's quite a natural fit, someone coming from a, a content background, moving into marketing automation. Um, so I'm less so um, you know, the creator of content and more the, the user of it. And a lot of my role is to think about that the types, different types of content, so not just a written form, but film or podcast, whatever it happens to be. Um, but how do I get that in front of the right person at the right time? So especially in the B2B world, that, that's quite a big component of it. Um, so I'm the global marketing automation manager at Zero, and I'm based out of their San Francisco office and work with a team um, globally, but um, in particular down in Wellington and in Auckland in New Zealand. Uh, and I've also worked previously in the US with Tate Electronics or Tate Communications as, as some folks might know it as, um, who's headquartered out of Christchurch as well. Um, so I'll just sort of tangent slightly and then come back to the automation side of it. Um, just, just to sort of tie in the, the US market part of it. And the, the next part of it is really just a bit, bit of fun um, to to get people to think about when they're, they're landing over in the US, um, where they might want to land, and um, just uncovering your US market. A lot of times, um, often people might come to um, San Francisco or California because it's closer and there might be other companies doing similar, but there actually might be other areas that you might want to look into for your company or your market as well. So 
the, the next the slide is actually a, a bit of a fun Q and A, um, and it's designed just to uh, be a bit of an, an online online icebreaker, um, and to get people to think about you know uh, what they might see in the news is, is often not um, uh, you know always there's sort of this deeper level in the US that people can look into. So um, the first question there, welcome to type it in. Um, but I, I didn't know this before actually. Um, and we actually did this uh, when uh, I was back in Wellington, and um, there were a lot of sort of quick, uh, eyebrows raised about it. And um, so I see some people from from uh, from my team chatting in uh, there as well. But uh, the, the largest football stadium in the US is actually uh, a college football stadium, and I think eighteen or nineteen of the top twenty are actually all college football stadiums. And so, in most cases, you might hear about the NFL, but this this college football scene is huge over in the US. Um, so, you know, Michigan, um, I think there's half a dozen stadiums that are, that are all over 100,000, and none of them are probably in the states that you think. Um, so next question, so there's two or three, um, and my team should be getting these right too, by the way, because we've already run through this. Um, but I think a lot of people probably know that there's, there's LA, New York, uh, you know, the top two, uh, and then there's Chicago, and, and people might know that Houston is uh, number five. And again, I wasn't aware of this beforehand either, but um, fifth, fifth largest is actually um, Philadelphia, the home of Rocky. Um, so yeah, that, that was something I wasn't aware of. I, I would, yeah, would have thought definitely somewhere in Texas, but um, I think when Dallas, uh, Dallas is broken up with um, the uh, uh, Fort Worth, I think right next to it technically, but um, uh, so, so last one on the, um, on the, and if nothing else, if you don't get anything else from this, this should be useful for your next pub quiz. Um, but the largest indoor concert, the largest um, number of people at the concert was performed a couple of years ago. <laughs> Someone has answered Donald Trump, and that could possibly have um, taken it uh, in the last few weeks. Um, but it's actually by a guy called George Strait, and there, there will be some people out there who have heard of George Strait, but many won't have. Um, and the sign on the left there sort of indicates his um, status in, uh, in in Texas. So, um, you know, this was just sort of meant to be a bit of fun Q and A, just designed to 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 get you to think about. There's actually this whole other world that you often don't hear about in the US. Um, and and um, someone has asked who George Strait. Is. George Strait is a country music artist, um, as well as Garth Brooks. So. Um, if you if you look him up, play him in the uh, play him in the office this afternoon. So just in terms of in terms of the US, when you when you're thinking about coming over here, or when you're thinking about you know splitting your time between um, coming over to the US and between New Zealand, there's probably you know a, a few things you could be looking at. And and like I said, you know coming into um, California seems like the obvious reason, um, yeah, or, or the obvious place to go, but. Um, you know, Air New Zealand's flying direct into Houston now, so it makes it that distance a little bit easier um, to go over there. Um, so when you're looking around for places to to maybe establish establish your footprint, you could be looking at some of those other areas. It's San Francisco, and Charles probably talked about this previously, but you know, it is quite is becoming a really expensive city to live in. It's an expensive to place to hire people. Um, and you know, it's just really expensive to live here too. So, um, you know, looking outside of San Francisco for other options might actually suit your business and your business case. It might be a bit cheaper, and there, there actually might be um, experts that are in those other areas. And, and in particular, um, you know, Houston's is the fourth largest city, but just up the road from there is Austin as well, and that's becoming uh, its own little tech hub. And I know on some of the other um, sessions um, that Sean's hosted, um, we've talked about Seattle as well being a bit of a, um, a, te a tech hub as well. So, you know, there's lots of options that are, could be outside of San Francisco. San Francisco could actually be perfect. You know, it's, it is a, um, a thriving scene. Um, but again, it's just um, take a look at the other options that, you know, might be out there as well. Um, in addition to just the location itself, um, there's also, uh, you know, alignment with um, certain either associations or um, uh, industries that, that might um, suit to different parts of the country, or um, you might be able to align your um, business with uh, other businesses that are doing something similar. 
And when uh, I worked at Tate, we had a, um, I think it was called a, a security association, but it was essentially a group of New Zealand companies, uh, included Gallagher and um, Winyard at the time. Uh, and we had an advocate who helped to work and, and get us into the federal government areas as well. So um, I think just when you're, you're looking at that footprint, it doesn't always have to be you. There could also be partners or resellers as well. Um, so, you know, when, when you're looking at that US footprint, um, just just try and understand a little bit more about your business case. Um, and there's definitely plenty of opportunities out there beyond some of those major states. And I think even we've noticed marketing spend wise, I think we looked at doing some advertising online, uh, uh, television advertising in California earlier this year. And we found advertising, television advertising in Alabama, um, which was maybe 10, 20 times cheaper. And that's not to say that Alabama was the right market for us, um, but it's just to say that, you know, there could be other options that might um, be more aligned to your budget and mix as well. Um, a few questions are sort of coming through about uh, what about Denver and, and Texas versus Colorado. Um, I'm not uh, specifically, I haven't lived in, in Colorado myself, but I, I think it's probably similar to Texas in terms of cost of living um, there as well. Um, and Denver, the, the other thing too about places like Denver or Atlanta or maybe Chicago is that the, the big airport hubs, so getting in, in and out of those uh, cities is, is a lot easier as well. Um, so they might be might not have a direct flight in from New Zealand, um, but they are a lot easier to get to than maybe some of the other um, cities and states. So we'll go, back, go on to uh, marketing automation and um, then sort of come back applying this back together. And I think one of the things I tend to find with, with marketing automation is that people's perceptions of marketing automation is often that it's email marketing. And a lot of the work that the team, um, that, that our team has been doing in the last couple of months has actually been only a small amount of it is the actual email part of it. There's so much, and that's why I've got the iceberg picture there, there's so much that people don't see that goes on um, beneath the visuals of an email that gets sent out. Um, the lead management side of it, the lead scoring, the building that uh, landing pages, uh, the campaign management, the integration with other tools, uh, automation uh, to Salesforce or, or automation to uh, the website itself. And then, um, believe it or not, things go wrong. Um, things break and, and data doesn't work. So you often do spend your time uh, looking to troubleshoot or build out the best practices so you don't have that problem again going forward. Um, so I've tended to find that although um, often people believe that you know, automation is tied closely to email, which it is, it's, it's a big part of it, there is a whole lot of other work that goes on actually in behind the scenes as well, um, which is not often seen. Uh, in, in just in terms of sort of lessons learned in marketing or automation, what I've tended to find um, at the moment, like I sort of said earlier, is that people aren't coming out of um, university with marketing automation degrees. Um, people aren't sort of specialised in, in it and they're often learning on the job like, like I did. Uh, so I've found that it's, it, it is quite difficult to find people who are actually trained on the tools uh, and you're, otherwise you have to train them on the job as well. Um, and if you're lucky enough to find those people, uh, they're becoming more and more expensive by the, by the day. Uh, the other thing is it's, it's not easy to go from manual to automation. I'll talk about this a little bit in the next slide. Uh, and then people also implement the tool and, and maybe it doesn't um, uh, do what they want it to do. So they actually have to put in a few add-ons which might uh, help to cleanse the data or enrich the data or do other things. Uh, and then especially in the B2B space, which is where I'm sort of coming from, is that you often require a huge pool of content to be able to feed, uh, nurture or to drive the demand as well. And again, that's not an easy thing just to build up um, through one or two people. So. It, it is very much a, a leading edge of, of marketing where marketing is heading, um, but in reality, a lot of workforces aren't set up to do everything that um, uh, marketing automation requires. So just in terms of the um, manual versus automated, specifically on that communications part, which is the part that most people see, so when, when you look at what's done manually or what you can look to automate, 
a lot of times people will set up things manually that are the likes of newsletters or um, best practice content. And by that, I mean a, a webinar or a, uh, a guide or some sort of cheat sheet. Uh, and even events, they're not something that can be automated um, from end to end. Um, but there are areas where you can automate, and especially in the product lines of things. So if you've got a, uh, a free trial offer uh, or even a product upsell, you can build that once and turn it on um, and obviously maintain it over time. But it's not something you need to do every week like you would with a newsletter. So one of the things I'm always conscious of and trying to think about is how can we automate um, everything that we're doing? And that could be the data side of it, could be the um, marketing communication side of it. But to try and get things as automated as possible so you can move um, your people around and um, in, into other areas. And this example is just a tool um, which helps, which pulls in content from your blog um, via RSS, uh, builds the email within, in this case, Marketo Marketing Automation Solution, and then can send you a test and then send it out to your database the day after. So all you're really doing is, is checking, confirming that the email is right before it goes out the next day. So there's always there's lots of things out there, lots of tools out there that can help you sort of move from this manual to automated state. In terms of automation versus demand generation versus marketing operations, um, I think there's sort of a few areas that I sort of see um, coming up, which, uh, and, and these are different types of job types, which, uh, or job descriptions or, or uh, yeah, job, job types or categories, I guess, that um, people are kind of looking for over here. Um, a bit more of, and there's obviously that automation space, um, and automation I think covers a lot of what maybe demand gen and marketing operations um, I have listed down here as well. Uh, and as the, as the organization gets a little larger, you tend to find that some of these uh, roles are broken out a little bit more. So in terms of demand generation, it won't always be just the top of the funnel or, or trying to get leads in, but that will probably be a majority of it but you may use some of those tactics along the way um, as you're looking to convert people as well. So that'll, that'll often be um, anything from um, content syndication to your SEO, your content, your newsletter subscriptions on the website, your often online events. Um, then on the other side of it is this marketing operations area. And there's often been, and often is a sales operations team um, at, at companies that own the likes of the sales process and then also uh, a tool like Salesforce as well. Um, but more and more so, there's there's more sort of marketing operations roles that are coming open where people uh, need to build out and support the framework for people to be able to do the automation or the demand generation. Um, to be able to manage the leads that go come in from your website and go into your automation system and over your CRM as well. So I think there's some clear definitions that are coming out um, in that sort of space as to what demand is versus automation versus operations. And just in terms of where they, where they fit in that B2B funnel, um, a, a lot of these uh, demand t uh, uh, tactics are in that sort of attract and acquire um, phase of the funnel. But a lot of them will be reused in that nurture and convert. But in many cases, that, that nurture, convert, and even keep phase is where the automation comes in. And we can start to build out those programs to um, get people on board uh, and also upsell them along the way. Um, the um, it, Just in terms of a, a scenario of a 30-day free trial, I'm just looking at the chats coming in, which is uh, uh, why I'm laughing every now and, now and again. Um, the in terms of a 30 day scenario, so if we put the demand gen and, and the automation um, in, into action here, uh, if you've got a free trial scenario, let's say it's a 30 day free trial scenario, um, number one there, in many cases, you'll see um, a lot of your demand tactics will be working to get people into the funnel. And you'll use them throughout a bit more, but you can start to use marketing automation along the way once you've got those leads captured you know, in points two, three, and four, and, and even five there as well to start to do a little bit of the work for you to get people on board, um, to get people uh, paying. And then the people that, that don't um, convert after having a trial, uh, you know, go back to them, revisit them, understand why that they uh, didn't purchase, or, or maybe the timing just wasn't right. So keep nurturing them down the line. 
And then once you have them as customers, trying to uh, see if you can uh, upsell them, get them to be advocates, cross-sell them, uh, or just prevent them from leaving as well. So a lot of that ties into to how the, the relationship between um, automation and demand generation um, goes together. One of the, the, the other part to um, automation, I think, in general as well, is that communications that we talked about is the problem with email is that uh, everyone's doing it. Um, so the trick now is how can you engage people beyond email? Um, the way I like to look at automation is is, is more actually about being a, a pool of potential and, and current customers um, rather than just an email tool. So how can you sort of build on, on that to be able to reach people in, in different areas? And now the sort of capability is to be able to use the data that you have in your automation system to be able to pass that over to your Facebook account uh, or remarket them on other um, display advertising platforms as well. So you can look to target someone um, with a, a message which might be around um, free trials or, or buying now, um, if they're already in a trial, for example, and instead of just emailing those, them those messages, uh, you could actually be targeting them through advertising. The other thing too is when they come back to your website, can you personalize uh, the journey for them? So if you know they're a trialist, can you serve up something in particular uh, when they come to your website uh, that's more based around their, them being a free trialist rather than just um, sign up for a new free trial now. And one thing um, which I think some people think is quite humorous and uh, is also a bit of a surprise is that uh, direct mail is something that just nobody uses right now. And uh, in a lot of cases, you know, I look around the desks over here, everyone's desks are so clean, there's no paper on it, no, nothing on it. So when uh, somebody gets uh, a gift in the mail, even a postcard, it's often the only real estate on, on the desk these days. So um, there's companies out there now that um, integrate with the automation tools um, and you can set it up in the same sort of workflow that you might to set up an email and it actually triggers um, out to a company to be able to send uh, promotional material to that person in your database. So, you know, that could be also another option. It's obviously a little bit more expensive than, than doing things online, but potentially more effective depending on um, your company. In, in terms of, um, you know, reaching out to people that you know in your database, you could actually have the right people in the database, but you just don't know the right data points. And again, there could be data enrichment tools that you could add to your marketing stack along the way to add your automation solution that helps um, to build out your, your next best prospect um, to engage with. So there's predictive marketing tools which you can um, look to integrate and, and they'll help to add on data that you, uh, to, to what you might have in there. They might be able to add people within that company as well if you're targeting a lot of high value companies as well. And I think the last thing that um, uh, is maybe often thought about but probably should be the, the first is, is related to reporting and spend. And it's often when you get far down the track when you've invested a lot of money that you start to think about um, you know, what actually worked. We should go back and you know, think about what worked. We should start recording on things. Uh, maybe then we'll know where to go to next. <coughs> and there's a lot of um, tools out there which are attribution tools, which you can plug into either your CRM or into um, your automation system. <coughs> and that will start to give you visibility of the actual marketing tactics and spend um, that are helping to move people into your database and then on over to um, sales and conversions as well. Um, so there's some really cool features which you can add into your, your automation system as well, which can help you um, target people beyond email, um, but just help make your life a bit easier when you're using a marketing automation system. So just in terms of how Zero uses marketing um, automation, so uh, this is just um, a very stretched map view which where the UK was lost um, in some sort of way. Uh, on there too, but we have um, in the last year we've sent out 48 million emails and um, 13 million of those were open. So it's actually a decent sort of open rate that we have, despite having you know quite high numbers. Um, we've we've got about 100 automated campaigns, 
that are currently running in the background in addition to all the other um, ad hoc email communications that go out, whether it could be for events or promotions or anything else. So we've got a hundred things that are always, always listing for something to happen. That could be someone filling out a web form. Uh, it could be someone that's just signed up for a trial. Uh, it could be a partner who's um, changed the status, for example. So there's a lot sort of running in, that, in the background. We have around 80 Marketo users um, around the globe. And we've got in in we've got regional administrators in five of those offices, and in addition to uh, trying to grow the company, there's also a big challenge for us to um, make sure that we train our staff right to be able to use this tool. Um, they keep adding new features. There's always lots lots more to upskill people on. So it's it's a challenge to not only grow the company and um, automate things, but also just to keep people uh, in, the, in their own respective areas um, up to date with, with what we're doing and, and what the tool's doing. And just in terms of, of the tools that we use, and I, I talked about a little bit about this um, um, marketing technology stack. Um, <clears throat> so we, we use Marketo as our automation system and Salesforce is our CRM. But we also have a bunch of other tools that um, are kind of at different stages of, of working together um, from Adobe, uh, our website, um, to integrating that to our Facebook and Google accounts. And then we've got also tools which we use for online and offline events as well. So we've, we've got quite a, um, a broad setup. And then there's a whole bunch of other tools which we use internally as well. Um, for internal communications and and also data as well. So this is really just a snapshot of really tools that are um, we're using on, on maybe a marketing side of things uh, in our campaigns. Um, and just just a question that sort of come in um, was just are we targeting um, small businesses or accountants with with Marketo? And, and the answer is we're targeting both. Um, and then. Um, uh, eventually it will be also our strategic partner so we have a lot of integrators and, and actually we still do now we we um, we work with um, developers uh, as well from from all the other companies that integrate with us so there's a, a regular developer newsletter that goes out for example um, but we're both looking to um, target small businesses and then also accountants and bookkeepers um, additionally So last couple of slides and then, then I'll bring it back for any sort of questions. Um, so how does this kind of all tie in together this sort of um, crazy presentation of, of sports stadiums, country music and um, marketing automation? I think one of the things from which I kind of wanted to point out um, with this particular audience is that there's probably certain things that uh, you just need to be on the ground for uh, in the US when you're um, when you're looking at you know how you're going to expand your business um, and uh, target customers. So I think you know a few of those things um, where the people add more value is those key targeted accounts where you need to get people on the ground, whether that's you or whether that's someone locally. Um, but, but they're often high touched and maybe a bit more localized in terms of the campaigns. Um, and then perhaps what you can look to do, and that's not to say that um, you don't need any input and it can't it completely is siloed. Um, but some of those opportunistic, some of those inbound things that come in through the website, or, or maybe it's a bit broader and there's um, specific industry-related focus that you want to focus on, you can maybe build that content um, in New Zealand or down there. You can build up some of the campaigns there. Um, you don't always need to be on the ground for all of these things. I think it always helps to have people san uh, sanitise, look over um, some of the emails, the documentation, to make sure that... Um, there's, there's not too many Kiwiisms in, in what you're doing. Um, but I think there's definitely a split between what you can do um, by not being on the ground in the US, but things that you may need to do. <coughs> and just in terms of from a B2B um, perspective and, and my sort of background on the content side of it, when you look at that sort of tactic wise, um, you know, you could break this down as to having a thought leadership topic or a few topics over your year. And there'll be certain certain ways where you could slice and dice that. And there's certain things that just need to be done, you know, on the ground. You can't do those remotely. The road shows or pre presenting a trade show, or maybe, maybe even PR uh, and analyst relations, you could 
perhaps do that remotely, but might be more effective um, uh, on the ground over here. Um, but then separately, uh, you know, some of these some of these things you could also look to do remotely: the guides, the webinars, the blog posts, podcasts, um, social media. It does help to have that US input, obviously, um, but you don't always need the resources on the ground to do some of these things. So last slide, I'll come back to some of the questions that are popping up and then we can um, add some more questions um, in there as well. Um, so I think just the thing for me is, you know, there's probably lots of advice out there for, um, you know, the best places to go in the US. And I think a lot of times it's just understanding a bit more about your market as well. <clears throat> there's often a lot, a lot of reason to maybe go somewhere closer or the obvious place, um, but it might not actually be the best fit for you. Um, just look at what tactics could be done remotely and in market. And then specifically on the automation side of things, um, just think about that as there's more than an email marketing tool. And when you are doing the actual communications part to it, just think about what can be automated versus um, what could be done manually and the trade-offs with doing both of those. I think the last point I'll just make is that um, at, at zero, I think we've been really, really lucky um, to find uh, an awesome group of people um, around the globe that um, have come in, some with knowledge and some without, um, but we've really grown together and built this sort of strategy and plan out together. Um, so we've been extremely lucky um, with the staff that we've got right now to build that out. Um, it is a challenge to find. So, um, you know, when you're looking out there, um, just making sure you find the right types of employees or contractors, whether it's in New Zealand or, or in the US to help you um, do the automation, the digital side of it, the demand gen. Cool, is that so, a wrap? Sean, can you hear me? That was the last slide. I can, can Why you hear me? me? I can't hear you. So oh, can anyone else hear me? If... We can hear you both. Great, okay, so um, questions. Okay, I'm the only one that can't hear Sharp. <laughs> this has been an adventurous day, that's for sure. Um, can we answer this question? Um, are the zero apps marketed the same way? Yes, we can share the slides. So I'll, I'll go through and feed through, um, hopefully not talking over Sean um, because I can't hear her, but I'll, I'll go through some of the questions that are on there. Um, and um, just zooming back up there are, um, so um, one of the question was, um, do you have the same um, content in the US uh, as you do in New Zealand or separate content strategies? And we, we have, um, a team based out of Wellington that um, manage the content globally, but there is definitely um, local content that's created, uh, and there's often local um, uh, either competitors or nuances um, that might come up along the way as well. But um, <coughs> Zero actually does a really good job, and I'm, I'm not involved in the, in the content, um, so this isn't back on me, but I think we do a really good job with content, whether that's video, um, the guides that we create or otherwise. Um, but a lot of it is actually done out of, out of New Zealand. We do have a, a video team um, here in the US also, um, as well as a team being in New Zealand. And I think there's also one in uh, Australia as well. Um, so to get, in particular, uh, a lot of the case studies or local videos created. Um, another question was just, uh, are the zero apps marketed in the same way? So um, we've got different applications, text touch, which is one, um, which is to a certain audience. And the answer is they are marketed in a different way. And the text touch um, solution that we have um, is marketed to a different um, type of customer because it's often a um, <clears throat> contractor such as an Uber driver. So they're actually quite different to um, a small business which uh, might use the Zero Blue product. So there's often a different strategy around that um, uh, uh, as, a, as a comparison. Let's see, just flipping through. 
Um, so uh, next question was around building um, marketing automation. There's a lot of work. Can you give some advice for where you'd start <coughs> within a startup and how you'd scale it over time? Yeah, so it is a lot of work. Um, and I've I've always worked with um, Marketo and Salesforce because of the company size I've been in. But there's actually a number of, of smaller um, companies and HubSpot is, is a good example of this. And there's a few others out there that are, are better for smaller scale and smaller size. Um, and they're a bit more intuitive as well when you're just setting up um, some core programs. So often um, I, I would look into a, a a tool that's a bit more simpler and understand the basics of it before broadening out. Um, uh, so, so I think initially that would be the best place to start. Where where I've typically learned a lot is actually in um, in Marketo. There is a, a community environment, and they also have product documentation and webinars that are always ongoing. So I'll try and um, either sift th through that community um, at least once a week or listen to the webinars that come on board, um, and more so in the US, and, and I know they have them in Auckland every now and again, but they have um, user group meetings as well, where people go, uh, you can go along and, and speak with others that are using that particular tool or automation in general. And I've tended to find those really, really helpful as well. Um, and you get to speak to some, some really um, good people who have done some pretty cool things. Um, I think the other thing too is that there's, which I probably didn't touch on, is that there's often um, now building up a lot more agencies um, and there's definitely a few more in New Zealand as well which can help those deployments. Um, so I, I would you know, also look at those, sorts, obviously that there's a cost to that, but there is agencies that can help you get things um, set up right um, uh, from the start. And that's probably one other thing to note is that it's, it can often be a bit of a painful experience to uh, go back if you set things up incorrectly. Um, so having it set up right from the start could be wor a worthwhile sort of investment. I think there was just a question about there about the slides, and I can definitely um, send those slides over. Um, and Sean might be able to answer the question about the recording of it. Um, <coughs> Maybe if you see my mouth moving, you'll know that I'm talking. The, there's a question around, um, are there any default metrics for tracking conversion within these campaigns to measure if something is successful or not? Um, that's always been a, um, a challenge at our time at zero, and, and we kind of know that and we're working towards that. But in general, I um, tend to think there's often three layers of metrics that um, you should be looking at. And, and in general, those um, there's lots of... Um, if you think about almost that, that triangle that I was showing you on the, the second to last slide here. Um, but there's lots of email metrics that you'll have. you have the opens and the click-throughs. And so I think you should always be looking at that um, and always be understanding you know, what's working, what's not. And then there's the next level up of, are people doing what you wanted them to do? Um, so are they have they downloaded that white paper or have they watched that video or whatever it is that you wanted them to do, are they actually doing that? Um, and then I think the metrics that um, the business really cares about is, is what's the contribution um, over time um, that automation is, is making or just in general other tactics, which is why um, you know, some of those attribution tools are really key for that because you can get to see the whole journey of someone if they've clicked from paid search, um, if they've then gone to a webinar and maybe clicked on a few emails. Um, you can start to attribute dollar values to um, whether that campaign's actually been successful or whether that tactic's been successful as well. Um, I can get a question. Do you use online marketing campaigns to test a, a market state city before launching an on-ground presence? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we, there is a bit of that going on on our website um, in terms of um, uh, a bit more personalization and testing. And with some of the personalization side of it, um, I know that they're starting to put up, well, they have, when they um, launched it a while ago, they were putting up a, a photo of the local city that you, your IP address might be associated with, where you're coming in from. Um, but in terms of that uh, launching, uh, uh, do we use online marketing campaigns to test uh, a market city or state? 
before launching an on-gram present. Yeah, I think it's definitely um, worthwhile doing that. Um, and what what um, Zero, the, the North American team has actually started to do and what uh, we did when we were at Tate is we started to focus on certain areas. Um, we, we tried to get a little bit of research beforehand. So what were maybe some geographical areas where we had success? Uh, and in particular, when we were at Tate, we tried to drill that down to the county and the city that um, where we might have had success around it and, and formed a bit of a beachhead. Uh, and then look to understand whether there's um, customers in those areas that we could target specifically, uh, and then put them funding into those areas um, before we sort of went in there on the ground. So there's often a bit of research done beforehand, um, and then some money invested um, to test the water before going in fully. Um, so questions around um, ABC testing in, in marketing automation. So often in most cases it is it is built in and best practices. And um, I, I think me and me and our team know um, that um, we should be doing a lot more of it. There's, there's often um, uh, things that get in the way, launching new programs, troubleshooting, lots of other things, but it's definitely um, baked into you know the marketo tool that we use, and we should be doing a lot more of it. Um, and, and we do do some um, in in um, email in particular. In, in one um, project that um, we're actually looking at um, is around uh, being able to uh, automate the conversion of a trialist with as little human touch as possible, and understanding what that sort of um, silver bullet or some semi-silver bullet might be of if we do X, Y, and Z, um, can we actually convert some of those people without a sales follow-up or a, a customer support conversation? So um, within within that um, project itself, we're doing a lot of different testing each week. And um, and I say we, it's, it's a lot more, there's, there's a few people in the team that are doing a really awesome job rather than me, but um, the team at Zero that's doing it um, is looking to, to trial the difference between an HTML email one week versus a blank email template the next week versus you know some of those multiple tactics so targeting people on Facebook then also on email um, so trying to find out the best way to convert them so that we can move maybe some of our resources around to some of those more strategic accounts as well um, just a question around um, why is HubSpot not ideal for, for larger teams and yeah, it's probably not um, right to say that it's not um, ideal for larger teams, but it's probably more appropriate for smaller teams. Um, I haven't looked at it you know, in the last six to 12 months, but I do believe it's probably um, a little bit cheaper than some of them out there, um, price-wise, not necessarily feature-wise. But also, um, I think when you start to look at building up um, you know, your automation solution um, or, or choosing a larger one, you also want to look at sort of the functionality between beyond the email um, nurture and, and some of the form side of it. So, um, you know, a lot of the challenges that, that we sort of have as we get data flows in and out at zero is as we want um, to we want to integrate it with more other tools as well. So, um, you know, the solution's got to work with um, our website. It's got to work with our, our data warehouse. It's got to work with um, you know th these other uh, event tools as well. So it could just be around scalability, often of the technology. Um, so a question around, do you support the accountants who are partners with automation? And I think that's something that we would look to do down the line. If, if, if I think the question is, you know, do, um, do we almost help them by sending out emails on their behalf? Um, so there's, there's a couple of different ways in which we do try and do that currently, and we have an advisor directory, which um, was actually just relaunched this week, and there's been some really cool stuff done on our partner side of things in the last week or two, um, which has taken, which has been built up for the last um, six to twelve months, which is really, really designed to help our partners. And one of those examples is we have an advisor directory um, where a small business can come and look for uh, a zero advisor. And when they fill out that form, it shoots an email to the accountant and bookkeeper. Um, and it'll also shoot an email back to that person, a confirmation email. But the idea is it's, it's designed to help our, um, our advisors 
um, generate leads um, and also be the point of contact as well. So we are kind of doing that already with, in, some, in some ways, but I expect that that will probably grow over time. Um, so next question is, can you give us some examples of marketing automation that integrates with a SaaS application and triggers based on activities? Interested to see how you think about it and what automation you trigger in some of those different scenarios. So um, if, if I'm answering the question right, one of the, um, <laughs> depending on who, who you speak to maybe, but one, one scenario I think we'd like to get you down the line is we'd like to be able to send communications into our product um, into an in-app notification from Marketo itself. So the idea that um, we could automate um, the email journey in addition to um, within the product as well, automating um, a, a prompt uh, or an in-app notification. And so while we, we're still looking at that, side of things there that would be triggered through a webhook um, capability so I think when it comes to you know coming back to um, scaling and having a larger automation um, system or, or a larger company I think that's some of the um, areas where automation kind of hasn't grown as fast as people would like um, and I think that um, you know people uh, and now have these expectations of, of automation solutions and the, and the companies just aren't maybe running as fast as um, people's op people have the ideas about them. Um, but there, there is definitely a uh, scenario where you could um, do a trigger based on something that's maybe um, happened. And you know, the example would be for us in that case, um, if someone um, became a trialist, we would look to try and trigger an uh, app notification um around you know welcome to your trial um does that answer the question on that i'll, I'll go through the next one but just let me know if that um, does or doesn't um <clears throat> i'll go through the next one and it, it says you spoke earlier about targeting leads on email and facebook to push for conversion do you keep the marketing message consistent between the two mediums or different um also another one we, we've been learning a lot at zero as well um, because we're starting to grow as a company, we've got lots of different teams doing lots of different things. And so in general, um, yeah, and th the theory is yes, you should be able to do that. But it's always that easier as business grows. With a smaller, you know, nimble business, if someone's, if you've just got one maybe digital marketing manager, um, you could definitely do that. But the idea would be the uh, if you're targeting people um, to convert for, for a free trial, for example, um, or to sign up for a demo, whatever it happens to be, uh, via email, then you could look to do that same message on, um, you know, through your Facebook. You know, the banner could be something like 10 reasons why you need a demo, whatever it happens to be, send them to the landing page with a demo sign up. But yeah, I definitely recommend it. I think there's probably um, always an opportunity for um, a bit of a mixture, um, you know, almost the default bucket um, of people as well when you're doing the likes of um, um, paid social. Or, or just pay display in general. Um, but yeah, in those scenarios, it's I think that's where it'll become really effective. Um, so the ne next question is, marketing automation is a great tool, but often abused. So how do you avoid spamming prospects with junk content? When is too much, too much? And how do you establish the right cadence? Um, yeah, good question. Um, so I think it comes back to the, the question that someone asked a little bit earlier about reporting. And, uh, and also, you know, when I mentioned about that sort of iceberg um, graphic of um, you know, what you spend your time doing, um, you might actually find that you're actually spending your time looking at um, you know, this question, for example, uh, looking at your communications rather than just building, building new communications out. You might spend your time reporting on it. You might spend spend your time trying to understand um, what's working and what's not. Um, and it won't always be the same in every company, but you want you, you want to think about um, opting people out of communications if they're not interacting. Um, in terms of the amount of communications that someone receives in, in a week or a monthly basis, I think that's often um, done by company, and often 
can differ in market too. So, you know, I, th I think in the US, people are a bit more comfortable with maybe receiving a bit more email, um, but in other markets, uh, not so much. So it isn't always a, an easy um, sort of solution, but, you know, I, I tend to think a few emails a week, if I'm getting that from one company, um, is, is starting to get to be a decent sort of amount, which is why you need to look into those other sort of tactics. Um, and then again, if people aren't engaging, um, you could only send, you could, you could just send the emails to people that have engaged. So if someone's looked at an email in the last 30 days, then send them something else. But for everyone else, maybe give them a month off, for example, or a few weeks off. And I think just the answer to the question of how you establish the right cadence, I think that often just comes back to your tracking and reporting and, and looking at what's working. Um, looking at the unsubscribed rates um, and, and reasons if there's one. Um, and if that's getting above a half a percent on, e on emails and communications, then you're probably maybe doing it a bit too much. Um, and um, just, just a few questions about chatting offline. Yeah, I'm happy, happy to do that. And I'll, I'll flick my email to um, uh, Sean and, and LinkedIn as well. Happy to connect on that if uh, anyone's got questions afterwards. Um, I'm assuming and, and, you've Yeah, a few people have come through um, about uh, uh, in-app notification tools as well. And um, yeah, I think, that, think that's awesome, um, as well as a, a great sort of suggestion. Um, let's see, just browsing through the questions. So what is good content to show users who have visited your, to your website uh, but not downloaded a trial or given their email address? Any tips on content um, remarketing to these users? Yeah, I, I think um, depending on, um, uh, you know, if it's the 30-day the free trial scenario or, or if it's the, um, you know, if it's a lot for larger um, demo request, um, responses um, it, it tends to be you know a lot around at the moment is you know listicles of top 10 things and uh, um, those sorts of scenarios I think again it might depend on um, you know who, who your audience is as well um, but I think uh, you know industry best practices often uh, are quite useful one that's not too producty for a certain type of audience, but then there could be also um, specific producty ones um, for for a more sort of technical buyer as well. Um, but I've, I've, I've often tended to find that something that's a bit bit broader, um, that's almost that sort of dummies guide um, to X, Y, or Z, is pretty useful um, for getting people in the in the top of the funnel, um, and then for you to be able to nurture them along the way. Um, uh, and, and then I think just consistently, if if that's the sort of approach um, for you, then it's just about encouraging them to to pick up that trial, um, uh, you know, along the along the way when you you're sending out the emails. So I think we've got one more question, and then we'll um, I'll hand back to Sharon to wrap it up. Um, and it's uh, how many emails, and what is the length of your con? Tact program for your lead nurturing workflows. Yeah, so uh, good question on um, the emails. So, with uh, with my previous company, and even um, at zero, we have a weekly newsletter that goes out every Saturday, um, and that's often where current customers, but also potential prospects, receive that once a week. So, for nurturing wise, I think once a week is a pretty good time frame, and in terms of times. A, times, days of the week, um, we often found it at my last company that um, sometimes the weekends were actually pretty good to send uh, emails out, and, and especially Sunday because um, everyone's spamming you during the week, uh, Monday to Friday, um, and you know now everyone's got their mobiles on them, and you know a, a lot of times people will, um, for better or for worse, check their work email uh, on the weekend. So, um, you know, I often think in that nurture stage that um, once a week is pretty good. With um, the lead nurturing workflows, what um, you know, we'll, we'll 
we're, we're working on here at Zero, and what I've done previously is often to try and segment that um, nurture as much as possible, if you can, and have a sort of a default bucket, which is a catch-all. Um, but the idea that you can serve up people um, content that might be more specifically related to their industry or their job title, um, and uh, and then then nurture them for for you know once a week. I think um, you know after two to three months, you probably want to um, check as to whether whether they're really interested. Along the way, you could ask them, offer them sort of free trials or free demo requests. Um, but again, if they're engaging, then maybe um, you want to keep them and add them on. But I think after a so three month period, you sort of want to assess whether you know they've made the decision or not. Um, and I think that's sort of a, a time to you decide whether you want to um, keep keep them going, maybe send them some more things, or um, or maybe just hold off on sending them something for a while and re-engage with them after three to six months later. So I'll hand back to Sean. Awesome. There we go here. Um, wow, this has been a great webinar and also a very exciting one. Um, not being able to hear Tim, but um, I think it's been a fantastic. Um, sort of um, overview of marketing automation. And um, yeah, thanks for putting up with our technology issues, but I think the content more than spoke for um, everything else. And um, so it's recorded, um, we'll release it um, in about half an hour, and we will probably share some slides as well. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for tuning in. If you have any questions, um, just fire them through to me um, if we've missed anything. And then I guess we're doing another uh, webinar next week as well um, with Rich Chetwin from This Data. So if you're a founder or you're interested in sort of the Kiwi founder stories expanding to the US, I would uh, tune in there. And um, yeah, so thanks so much for tuning in. Um, do you have anything else to say? Thanks. All right, cool. All right, see you later, everyone. <laughs>